um, but I, it's, this is a nice small group, be interactive, ask questions. Usually you've got somebody in your head you can think about. It's hard to make Miller Falls very exciting. Um, we're going to try. All <laughs> jokes and things like that. Um, but, you know, you think about people you've known and the symptoms and maybe questions they've already started asking you. Uh, I'll tell you right off the bat, your best resource to look at after today is menopause.org. So pretty easy to remember. <laughs> menopause.com sells Premarin. They got there first. So. Mm -hmm. .org is the North American Menopause Society, which is the group that just studies and looks at the science, not biased by anybody's anything. Um, so it's kind of the latest. It's got handouts for patients, just all kinds of stuff. So I send patients there because needless to say at a 20-minute visit, I don't have time to tell them everything. Um, I think the educator you know, wants to teach them stuff so they can, you know, go on their own and, and do things. Um, but uh, I do this again for our students. They only have about 10 or 15 of them come to class because they record us and they all watch it at home. Um, I tend to talk fast, so my apologies tell me to slow down. I'm fast enough that they can't double speed me usually when they're watching the recordings like they do with most people. So maybe I do that a lot. Um, but we'll get some simple basics. We'll kind of talk about just like what we look at in this age group women just for their regular checkups, um, the symptoms they have, and what we do about it. Hormone therapy is something you could talk about for hours anyway, but we'll just kind of talk about the basic ones out there. And they're a lot like birth control pills. It's like it's just a juggling act to find the two in the balance that works for that individual. So there's a lot of right answers. That's kind of the way I put it, um, including picking nothing if that's what they choose. Um, so to define it, we do have an age we give them. Its average age is about 51 or 52, and the definition is one year without a menstrual cycle. <clears throat> but I remind them our eaters that isn't that smart, and at 14 months they have a period, they all get upset, they come in, and it's like, you know, it just decided it wasn't quite done. Um, we investigate, we have a few ways to look at that, but that's the definition we give it to consider someone uh, menopausal. Um, the perimenopausal transition is the time when things start changing, uh, hot flash, Hot flashes can show up while periods are even still regular. So they may be doing this at 44 and saying, I'm still having my cycles. Um, they can have a change in vaginal dryness even after that time. So things can show up before the actual cycles that we <coughs> define it from have, have gone. Um, we can do some lab studies that show us maybe where they are, their FSH, which can elevate. I always tell them their pituitary jelly in their ovaries because it goes up because their ovaries aren't feeding back with estrogen. They, they, um, if we have somebody before 40, we used to say that was a premature menopause, now we call it primary ovary insufficiency. Same thing's happening, we just gave it another definition, uh, that the ovaries have stopped their cyclic function ahead of what we consider to be a normal age for them to do that. So for those folks, which is only about 1% of people that it happens to naturally, we do investigate uh, as far as doing some labs, looking for other reasons, checking thyroid function. We don't check estrogen levels. And just know right now, we don't check hormone levels to decide how much to give somebody. Um, so we would be looking just to see that, yes, they actually are having low function. So we, we look for that elevated FSH. We make it happen sometimes because we may take up their ovaries for various reasons, like endometriosis. Um, they may have chemotherapy, things like that, where it, we can create, uh, uh, shall we say, death of their ovaries, um, so that they don't have their estrogen function anymore. Um, I've had some lately who were being treated with um, for breast cancer, and one recently, she was in her mid-40s, and after her treatment was done, then her cycles came back, and she was not happy about that. <laughs> she got used to not having them, plus now she's going, oh no, I've got estrogen still in my system. So, uh, as we do with some of our patients, like the BRCA-positive people, we offer nephrectomies for them. Um, so, we spend about a third of our life in this age group, so, me being one of them, we try to stay healthy. So, we want to keep these people moving, and and active and well, so it's a significant span of our life. This is a table from NAMS and others that, um, uh, looking at the just the stages. It's re reproductive and aging, women staging. So you can pick apart where someone is. Uh, it doesn't change anything that's happening or where they are, uh, but if they are someone scientifically motivated, they may want to kind of see what's coming. It just sort of tells you when their last period is, the final menstrual period, the uh, noted up top. Um, and then before that, there may be some hormonal changes you could document if you needed to, their cycle patterns or symptoms. Uh, the part after it, the first few years are considered the early postmenopause time. Um, we do have some things that matter in that time, like there's more bone loss for a few years right after in that early years. And then the late postmenopausal post time I always is until they themselves are late. It's just the rest of their life in that time frame. So that's just a way of kind of plotting it out if you felt so inclined. 
So what's happening to the ovaries? Uh, you might remember we start losing our eggs before we're born, right? We've all heard that, so they're just always being used. Uh, we don't just use one each month, a whole bunch of them try to get started, make a follicle. One gets to be the dominant follicle and ovulate, and the rest just sort of fade away. So we know we're losing them all the time, so now it's from that natural loss most, most of the time, which speeds up in our 30s, which is why we talk about the um, fertility concerns that can happen later on. Uh, I mentioned looking at the FSH and LH, those are going to get elevated, because FSH is, is uh, telling the ovaries to make their estrogen, LH trigger makes us ovulate, when we don't feed back estrogen and inhibit to our brain, it says, hey, I said get going. Mm -hmm. um, that's why women in their 40s sometimes even have irregular cycles, closer cycles, because it gives it a second oof and gives them the second stimulation. That's why they sometimes have spontaneous twins more. They may actually be told to ovulate again because it doesn't think they did, because then get feedback. So fun times for those people who weren't planning anything then. Um, the androgen availability increases with age, and I phrase it that way because we don't make more. You know, women are older, if they don't do hormone therapy, more so in years past, you know, they come in and they're getting these funny little hairs they don't like. They don't have more, more androgens or more testosterone. It just doesn't have uh, the competition, and our estrogen made sex hormone binding globin, which kept some of it out of circulation from being free. Estrogen's lower, the binding globin is lower, and now that testosterone is more free, and it gets to show itself. So the hair changes can happen. So when people take their estrogen hormone therapy, they may have less of that happen. Some of that too is ethnic. We just know we all have different amounts of fuzziness that we're going to have. Um, the adrenals decrease their DHEA, DHEAS, and the ovaries decrease androstenedione. So there is just some decrease in levels. But our ovaries slow down their testosterone production between our 20s and our 40s. So it's kind of that adolescent time that's doing its job, getting all the, um, the terminal hair growth where it's supposed to be. Um, so women, by the time they're menopausal, that's when they start going, oh, my libido's down, I need some testosterone. They've probably been low, maintenance low, for a decade or more. Um, so it doesn't go down again at that time. Um, but that's when people think to talk about it and ask about it, because that's when their brain clicks over from contraception to hormone therapy and replacement. So there's lots of things that happen around now that people don't always like. Um, the changes in bleeding pattern, again, that's how we get our definition a year after. No period can be menopausal. Uh, hot flushes happen to the majority of people. Sleep disturbances, we've shown even happen when not related to waking up with a hot flash. There are some people who can tell you what time that flash will wake them up, but others who don't have any, and just say they can't sleep anyway. Uh, the vaginal dryness and discomfort with sexual activity, and we're going to just kind of talk about how to fix each one of these as we go along. Uh, urinary changes, because the urethra has estrogen receptors, so it loses some of that epithelial health. Um, if I could fix the decreased libido, I would work less hours and have happy clientele, but there is no magic treatment for that. Um, I should have a picture, you may have seen of that men and women, you know, there's a man box with one knob and a woman with dials and knobs and switches. And just, we're thought to have a lot more input to what makes us have a healthy and active libido than the guys. So it's harder to, to directly fix. Um, cognition concerns, women will talk about feeling kind of fuzzy or foggy during that time frame. Um, but it does not correlate with any memory issues that are real and permanent. Weight gain, sadly, you get five pounds for free just when you go through menopause. And because cortisol is more available, not more of it, but it, it is more available, it goes right here where nobody wants it. So they will always complain about this. Um, people want to mention it because they also know, oh, that mid-body mid Fullness is one of the few things we tell people about when they're worried about ovarian cancer, which we're lousy at finding. So they're concerned when they feel this around the middle, but quite often at this age, it's a bad gift. Um, skin and hair changes, um, sometimes hormonally related. We lose some collagen, so uh, skin doesn't have uh, as good of turgor. So any questions or anything, y'all just throw it out. It's a conversation. Um, the routine evaluation, so we have a clinic now um, that we're getting rolling, uh, just a menopause clinic, because our residents, if you're familiar with our clinic system at all, they have their women's clinic, and it's very heavy on OB, um, and it's heavy on GYN problems that gets in, sometimes for funding reasons, uh, but they don't get a lot of just regular well people coming in for checkups, so they don't get many of this age group at all, so we have a clinic we're starting up where this is all they see is some of uh, my peer group. So what do these people need on a routine visit? Um, they may be well, they may have a primary who manages other things, but you're there for their GYN wellness. <coughs> and we're always going to make sure we know their height and weight. 
height, we try not to use what they say. Uh, because we know vertebral compression over time can make them lose a little height. They may not have checked it in a while, or they may wish, as an I am, that I'm still 5'4", but probably not. Uh, but we actually want to measure their height. Um, I've had people, uh, I had a nurse one time who would ask patients at the scale, may I weigh you? I was like, it's not an option. They're going to get on the scale. They can turn their back. Some do. They don't want to see it. But I want to know as a baseline, because when they want to ask me or let's see a difference years later, I've got to know what, what it was. So we do get their um, height and weight. Our EMR calculates BMIs for us. Um, the hip waist ratio, one of our uh, faculty who is also a, a NAMS provider, um, Dr. Wild works more with like the metabolic side of menopausal and, and mature women uh, in PCO. So that is something they're better at getting on a routine basis. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure you've all kind of heard how this is some think a better way than just throwing out a BMI number at somebody uh, for their reflection of adiposity and then cardiovascular. Oh, we want to know everybody's baseline blood pressure. They may or may not have a primary. <clears throat> Some women are very healthy, and they may be 40 to 50 is easy before they even think, well, I guess I should get a primary now, even though I don't have anything that needs maintenance. Um, there do get to be some kind of routine testing that we do for this age group. So pelvic and indicated pap smear, because I don't know what GYN lectures you already had, but pap smears are not every year anymore. Um, I mean, women 40s and over pretty much are ingrained. You do this every year. We've had kind of weaned some of those ladies off of thinking that they're missing anything if we don't do the lab test. And that's how I'll describe it. It's like the pap smear is a lab test part of your pelvic exam. Some think that's all it is. They also think when they go to the ER with pelvic pain and get cultures, they have a pap smear. Not usually the ER does not care about maintenance, wellness, like pap smear. Um, so we do it when it's in the guidelines, which you might know is every three or every five if HPV is also negative. And new guidelines out also just a couple weeks ago, um, started accepting just HPD screening people, which they've talked about for years might be all we need to do. So your generation and such, it's maybe swabbing people. If the virus isn't in there, you're not worried about looking at the cells, which is what pap smears do. So uh, public exam depends on what they're coming in for and talking about. Uh, we do believe, you know, we should do it somewhat routinely. Um, they've shown if we do a pelvic exam and feel a fullness on a menopausal woman, it's 95 plus percent chance it's benign, but we're still going to investigate if we felt something. Um, we also don't find ovarian cancer by pelvic exam until it's probably stage three. So we're not very good at it. Um, but it's kind of all we got is starting off with an exam, questioning of symptoms. So, you know, at least every couple years in the older age group, which is all Medicare will pay for after 65 and every two year well exams, then we do a bimanual just to make sure we don't have anything that catches our attention. Lifestyle concerns could be their entire visit smoking, alcohol, exercise, diet, all these kinds of things. Uh, I wish everyone could get a nutrition console covered, or so many patients could, um, because they could use the education and guidance, but despite insurance, knowing that obesity causes problems and we're not one of the best states. Um, I always say thank heavens for Mississippi, <laughs> we're not at the bottom. Uh, but we do have to work on some of that wellness aspect. Breast screening, this is mostly just to show you there's not one answer. So lots of different organizations, Cancer Society, Cancer Institute, NAMS, Task Force, all of them don't quite say the same thing. Um, the sort of general middle of the road is really kind of about where ACOG is. Um, they used to say baseline at 35, now it's acceptable at 40. Some even say, don't worry about it till you're 50. But um, in people's heads, they kind of want to know before then, it may depend on family history, personal history, other risk factors um, that they may need to start sooner. The sooner you start, the more dense the breasts are. Breast density is right, it's considered a risk factor now, not just something they notice. It's always made it harder to look through, so they've actually decided it's indicating continued estrogen and may actually be a risk factor. So you can pick what you're comfortable with. Most of us say baseline by 40, every one to two years till 50, and most of them agree annual after 50. So ACOG, the bottom one, kind of tends to be the middle of the road answer. Um, so the breasts do change at this time. They're going to see less hormones over time. So they decrease in size and um, they decrease in support. So I hear about as many people now when they get any kind of breast thing done, they're doing lifts, not implants, so they're just kind of pulling back up there. Um, and it's true, you think about all the people who've gotten implants, some regret it over time, never had anybody who got a reduction say they were sorry about that. So just kind of when people are thinking, should I get that? You decide. Um, so we know that this, those tissue changes are going to happen normally. Um, the ratio of fat to fibers changes, which is great. It's like, well, time makes them more see-through when they need to be. Because as we get older, 50s and 60s increased uh, decades for breast cancer. 
um, they're getting a little more transparent. Um, you hear about the 3D mammography. Um, no one in this room besides me has probably had a mammogram before, but you know, they're squishy flat. It used to just take an image. Now it takes it a second and it arches over, and it takes an image that they can slice up like a CT scan. So instead of just seeing the spot before that they didn't know where it was in the depth, they can kind of figure it out and look at it better. Um, MRIs see more things that we need to see and cause more biopsies and evaluations of benign conditions. Um, so those are not for screening. They use them in the high-risk group who, say, has a first-degree relative with breast cancer or something that needs a little more evaluation. Um, but uh, the imaging is getting better, and hopefully the 3D will stop being an extra fee for some people and just be part of their routine mammogram coverage. Any questions on breast tissue? This group usually needs to be suggested to have colonoscopy. Um, it's a lot easier to talk people into mammograms and paps and colonoscopies. Uh, and it's the day before no one likes uh, the, the prep. Um, whether you do it by drinking or there's some pill versions, anything that's going to clean it out isn't real fun. Um, the guidelines, you may have heard um, the uh, Answer Society, I think it is, is the one who just asked to start screening at age 45. So it's not become the routine or accepted by the other. So this is what we've, we've had until just sometime in the past month or so where that one organization said start sooner. So for most everybody, it's age 50. Um, if they'll do it, they only have to do it till they're 75. They only got to do a few in life. Um, so they can consider every 10 years if they get good answers, they only have to do it a few times. Some people would rather do the uh, a fecal blood testing either via cards where they will do three cards at home and send them back, and that's a yearly thing they can do. Um, the uh, FIT is the um, immunohistochemical test that looks like a little pregnancy test, but it's a similar idea that it's still test two stool. Sigma endoscopy can be done, obviously it doesn't see the whole colon, so uh, it's not as good if you're going to clean out and might as well have the whole colonoscopy. Um, very minimum and CT are other ways to do it. People want to know if they can swallow that little camera pill. It's like, oh, we don't really have that as our regular screening now. So we still recommend colonoscopy. The most people who won't do it will do the yearly quiet cards for me. Um, and my nurse loves getting those back in the mail. <laughs> they will envelopes, I think. <laughs> we just dropped our test and you've probably seen that before. And then if they're negative, we're, we're kind of done. Um, so screening labs, people will come in sometimes and say, well, I need my angle on my labs. I'm like, you're well, what labs are you talking about? Um, and they also come in sometimes saying, I need my hormone levels checked. And just calm down. Uh, but there are some screening things. If they don't have a primary, we may be the only one doing some of these for this age group. So lipids, most people should know what they are. They didn't inherit something. By the time they're about 35 or 40, the like, high triglycerides can be inherited. They just should know that they don't have those. Um, if they're being followed with cholesterol, then they should be with the primary care. Um, chemistries uh, can be used, such as a fasting to get a fasting glucose. If they had any reason yet, an renal function, liver function basics. Uh, A1Cs are uh, acceptable screening also for someone to make sure they don't have prediabetes or sneaking by with diabetes. We test all the pregnant ladies on the first visit now with an A1C to find those who may have been diabetic and just never wanted to know or thought they were. So we know right off the bat before we do our screening during pregnancy. TSH that used to be said to be checked around age 45 or later. There's no routine that has to be done, but um, I check most of them because someone can't lose weight, and about one out of 100 might be the answer. Um, but we check that a lot for <coughs> various symptoms. I mean, what do you hear people say when they? think they have low thyroid function. They're tired, their skin's dry, their hair's changing, constipated. Everybody raises their hand if they're over about 50 for that one. So um, mm -hmm. we check TSHs a lot just to kind of check it off the list, set it aside. Because that's easy. You fix that. Other things fall in place pretty well. So. Vitamin D is becoming more well known as a uh, deficiency, um, either by people not getting sun because we don't want skin cancer um, or just an inadequate diet. Uh, so we do check that frequently. It's in my little trio. I check for fatigue, which is thyroid, CBC, and vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And do you know what a normal D level is supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Guesses? Mm -hmm. 50, 45? Um, oh, above 50. about mid-30s. Th that's about where people should be. And I had people like 5 and 9. Mm -hmm. One was an adolescent who probably had an eating disorder. Uh, one was a Muslim lady who nothing but hands and face saw the light a day. So kind of some logical reasons. We know obesity can increase in northern climates, lack of sun exposure, so lots of variables. Um, and people can take supplements if they need them. So we check that occasionally. Um, STDs, the screening, if needed, if it concerned, if exposure, 
women in this age group, if they usually ask for that, it's because they've got a new partners, changing partners, that they're wanting to make sure things are okay. Um, HIV screening, Hep C. Do you know the baby boomer years mm -hmm. we're supposed to watch for? Was it 46 to 64? I finally remembered that because the numbers just flipped up. Mm -hmm. I, I knew I was in it, but I couldn't remember when. Um, so that's a, a screening one-time thing, unless they've got concerns for exposure in their current life. So there's not labs you have to do, just screenings to offer again if you might be there. <coughs> but they're not coming in saying, my G's low. They're coming in saying, my periods are all over the place. What's going on? Um, so we're going to talk through their cycle pattern to see what's going on. Um, as we mentioned, they may get even closer to cycle interval before they start skipping and missing, because everybody kind of knows that they go away, but some don't know that the interval may get a little closer. Again, the ovaries don't quite give back an answer, and the pituitary asks again. They get another cycle in two, three weeks. So they can get that irregularity. So most everybody has to go through this bit of fun. Um, I've had a couple folks who just said, I was regular, regular, and then they quit. I'm like, don't tell your friends that you didn't have to mess with surprises and irregularities, but it can be that simple. Um, usually it's just because we're not ovulating. The ovary has, you can send it some LH, but it's not going to ovulate for you and set up the rest of the cycle pattern. Um, so that's what is happening, especially at the, at the end of the menopausal time, because they don't ovulate anymore. Um, we, can about, we don't want to always just accept it. If there can be other reasons. What if she's got a BMI of 50 and she's got some irregular cycles? I've got to be thinking about too much estrogen, lack of ovulation, but yet that endometrium is still getting built up, and then they're at risk for, uh, for uterine cancer. So we want to just still look at them and think logically, is there anything else that it could be? The old portion of the zebras, right? So if they're 52, have some hot flashes, and they skipped a period, I'm not usually going to do anything about that, except we talk about what's going on. There's no test you have to do really to prove that. Um, if there are any meds or anything else that can influence it, obviously take that into account. The ways we look at it, the easiest and kindest would be an ultrasound, a transvaginal ultrasound. So we measure the endometrial stripe, which under four and under millimeters is fine if they don't have estrogen stimulation. And that idea is only good for the menopausal ladies. So I can't use that on a 35-year-old who's still cycling because she's changing her endometrium all the time. So when they, <clears throat> when they studied people and there was four or less, they did a biopsy on all of them, endometrial biopsy, never found a problem. So we're allowed to see that ultrasound finding and say, don't worry about it, not going not to do anything else. Um, if they uh, are in the office and I have the opportunity, I'll usually try to get my biopsy. It can give me a little more information about what hormones it's seeing. It may say disordered, meaning it's seen an ovulation, but didn't really get triggered. Not only, I'm really, really not cancer. That's what I want to make sure. And then I've got my shortage board of options to make her regular again. I just want to make sure nothing bad's going on. You can also choose to do nothing once you know that the tissue is fine. So if we can't get our biopsy, stenotic cervix in this age group, then we can always do the ultrasound. Hysteroscopy is where we go to the OR, put our camera through the cervix, and look inside with saline fluid. Um, that it allows us to also remove things we find. Because an ultrasound, if they do, and say they have a thickened endometrium, they could be pancaking out a polyp in there too. And I, they can't tell the difference. Unless they do the ultrasound that's got saline infused, where they put some fluid in there, now they can see that little dingleberry hanging, and we know that there's a polyp or a fibroid or something <laughs> tangible. That's my word for things like there's tangible something I can remove. Um, so we do have that kind of ultrasound. We don't tend to do it right off the bat. Um, but hysteroscopy lets us look and remove at the same time. Um, we have an instrument that just sort of Pac-Man kind of chews it up once we're looking inside the uterus. Um, you can do labs again to check their hormonal status if, if you need to. Um, and STD screening, if they have a ripple in endometritis from an STD, that's going to make them have some bleeding problems too. Um, so those are different ways we might think of working up when their cycle pattern is not what it had always been all their life. So then they have other issues that can show up. Y'all probably don't read the comics anymore, but having had a teenage son, I would have loved to have freaked him out that way, but I didn't. <laughs> um, so why do we even have to do that? Hot flash stuff. Nobody likes that. Um, they're not really sure, but the part of our brain that controls our temperature, they think it's real picky in a real narrow range, so that you get out of it a little bit, and suddenly you're trying to cool yourself off. So you vasodilate and try to get rid of some of that heat. Um, so that's the best description nowadays. And for the most part, it's not going to happen to someone who didn't have estrogen first and then had it taken away. So we have to kind of be primed throughout our life, and then they take it away, and then we can feel that. Um, they can last, you know, just a few minutes. They can last six months to 14 years. 
worse at night normally, but can also be bothersome during the day. People will talk about getting up and having to change their sheets and change their gown, just like they're drenching wet. It's like, that would disturb my sleep pretty well. Uh, but some people, again, have sleep problems without hot flashes. It affects the vast majority, and that's about the same amount of people we can fix when we give them hormone therapy. Um, some things are ethnically different. And in this case, African Americans have worse, Asians the least, and Hispanics and Caucasians in the middle. Um, and that seems to really pan out when you start seeing patients you realize that is kind of how it goes. Um, it's increased in obesity. We used to think, oh, they have like more conversion of uh, other hormones to estrogen in their fatty tissue, which is true. That's why we worry about the hefty folks having endometrial cancer. Uh, can you think why the obesity actually makes their hot flashes worse? More and them. All right, they're just insulated. I mean, literally. So they can't cool down as well. Um, so the th thinking kind of went from, oh, they've got more. They won't feel this as much to, oh, they can't cool off. So they do tend to have them. <laughs> Poor Jeremy and his mom. <laughs> so what can we do about them? And that's this is the main reason people come in asking for hormone therapy is they just want to get rid of this bothersome symptom for a, you know, a year or two or however long it takes and then they might not do hormone therapy anymore. Um, so we can fix them pretty well and it's the main reason they come in talking about okay, what can we do about it for estrogen therapy. Um, it's the most successful giving people back estrogen. Some people have tried progesterone and other hormones and they don't work nearly as well. It's like estrogen works this good and everything else is down here kind of with the options. So the, um, the North American Menopause Society or NAMS uh, is uh, US, Mexico, and Canada together. So the website does have a list of everything out there and it's updated. So on that website, if people are trying to decide, I send them out there, they can look at the list. It does let you know which ones aren't in each country because they don't all have the same things. So again, it works the vast majority of the time. If I'm giving someone an adequate amount of estrogen, even the higher doses, um, estradiol, the bioidentical, which people like, is $4 a month at Walmart. So bioidentical doesn't have to mean expensive and compounded, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but uh, if the, there's like a 0.51 and 2 milligram. If I'm giving them two, I've had people try to take more and they're still having hot flashes. They're just in that group that estrogen is not going to fix. So we can fix most people, but not everybody. <clears throat> if they stop, half of them may have it again, whether they try to taper off or whether they just quit it one day and see what happens. Um, so they can get them back. Risdel is something we've had for a few years, uh, which is a low-dose version of an SSRI. So they kind of figured out, hey, these people taking Lexapro and Infexor aren't having such hot flashes. Found out those, that's a nice side effect of that category of medicine. So they made a low dose extended release version that doesn't give them a lot of the side effects of an SSRI, but can fix their hot flashes. It takes it a couple months to really peak. Yes. This may be kind of a dumb question, but does hormone therapy delay menopause if a woman were to start it before actually entering those years? No, because we use birth control pills and everything else that's got higher doses. So in comparison, birth control pills can have about four times as much as I'll give somebody for hormone therapy to fix them. So, no, the ovaries aren't that smart. It's going to say they're just like, you tell them to quit for a while, they're like, okay, we'll just sit here and you tell us to ovulate again. Uh, but it doesn't change when we run out of eggs. Oh, like birth control pills don't save them, you know, because we don't ovulate, they still die. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't affect it. Um, the other, uh, like, uh, effects are especially, a lot of the breast folks have used that for the breast cancer patients who can't have estrogen. So they've, had, they've known we've had some things that might help. Um, but now we actually have one that's FDA approved, which is a nice change. That means it's not expensive and insurance will make them pay a lot for it. We get copay cards and things for a lot of medications. So we do have something at least to offer those who have a reason they can't have estrogen. Which we'll get to that too. Some people don't mind their hot flashes. They're just going to, Mother Nature should be in charge of their life and they're just never going to take anything. And that's fine. I used to say a hot flash doesn't kill anybody, kind of joking, but then one of our residents did a research uh, study with women who had preeclampsia and diabetes in pregnancy had worse hot flashes later on. We worry about diabetes and preeclampsia, hypertension, because they're vascular diseases. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, oh gosh, they've had these things with vascular stuff, now they're having hot flashes, and they have more. It's like, does hot flashes actually re represent somebody who's got more risk for vascular disease? So I still kind of say a hot flash never killed anybody, but there may be some risks. They'll figure that out in some years. So lots of things they can do that aren't medicine. Again, a lot of people don't want to take anything. They can step outside in the winter. Uh, weight loss again to get rid of some of that insulation. Uh, most all of these things except for the medications at the bottom are really placebo level. A 
effect. So that's the bottom line, black cohash, uh, plant estrogens, um, decreased smoking. Smokers have everything bad, obviously. Uh, but it also makes you have worse hot flashes and menopause two years sooner. So. Um, bad for your bones. So it's not good for this age group at all. But uh, some of the things that we use off-label, gabapentin or neurontin, uh, Lyrica, which is similar, can help hot flashes. Um, clonidine, which I've never really chosen to use because then I'm going to be messing with somebody's blood pressure. I really don't want to do that for its original purpose. Um, and the SSRIs, but sometimes so many women are already on the antidepressants, I don't end up having to have something to add. But that is something they can try. Other things they think have some evidence of success are cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy, and things like that. Um, the S equal is a derivative of um, <clears throat> isoflavones that apparently about 30 or 40 percent of women can actually convert those plant estrogen foods into this effective form that helps, but that means the majority of people actually can't make that for themselves. So they actually have supplements of that and they're looking at if that's any better. So people are out there trying to fix this little annoyance. Sometimes I think it's silly. We spent like a half day in one of the NAMS meetings talking all about hot flashes and I'm going, never hurt anybody. You know, it's not medically concerning in most ways, um, but lifestyle, it's a problem. So some people might not mind <laughs> their hot flashes as bad as others. <laughs> Any questions about just those symptoms or problems? Um, the other thing they come in for, maybe the vaginal dryness, sexual activity symptoms, which we can also fix pretty well. Uh, so in the majority, you can see about 75-80% of women are going to have each of these things, so you can keep that number in your head. So atrophic symptoms, when, if you looked at a microscopic <coughs> excuse me, section of the vagina, it would have basal, parabasal, and superficial cells, and after the estrogen goes, there goes the superficial cells, and they have all the elastin and stuff in them. So it's really logical that when those thin out, <coughs> that we're not going to have um, as comfortable sexual activity. So when the estrogen goes away, there's uh, less of the lactobacilli. That's what we want from the vagina. That's where the old e yogurt thing comes from, colonizing it with the right stuff. Um, you see over-the-counter products refresh with a pH in them, lubricants and things that we can use, trying to keep that pH lower to keep things healthy. Um, if you've done any other GYN lectures, have you all talked about other? <coughs> so you hear about bacterial vaginosis mm -hmm. a lot. Um, and that's not an itis because it's bacteria that's normally there. It's a balancing act, so pH is up when that one wants to live. So we want to keep the pH a little lower so the lactobacilli win. So that's what changes at this age is the pH goes up, so they get the wrong balance in their food. Um, if they have sexual activity, you can see changes. I mean, little tears, paper cut kind of tears, especially between the labia. Um, well, hemorrhagic, even putting in a speculum and letting it kind of rub over a cervix, you may all of a sudden get some little red spots there. The epithelium is just so thin, the vascularity will kind of get disrupted easily. And they'll be talking about their discomforts with intercourse. Um, so we want to make sure nothing else is going on. Uh, if there's any discharge, anything that makes us look for an infection. Uh, vulvar dystrophies are like in sclerosis, if you've heard that one, where it's the thinning parchment paper kind of look, especially sort of hourglassy around the perineum and lower labia. The opposite is hyperplastic, which is usually on the upper labia, it's like thickened from, as one of my faculty used to say, digging and scratching, because it's more itchy and the skin just gets thickened trying to protect itself. Uh, but those can lead to even some of our uh, cell abnormalities. So we want to make sure that it doesn't look like anything but good old-fashioned lack of estrogen. Um, the urethra has estrogen receptors, so more urinary tract infections in this age group, uh, because literally it's thinned out, bacteria just crawl right up to that ladder a little easier. So they've lost some of their defense. And our urologists, I've seen, start giving people estrogen cream lately when they have recurrent UTIs. So we've got them in, in on that. So we have to watch out for some of those things. <coughs> Vaginal estrogen therapy is what will fix them the best. Um, there's a few other things we can also try. Not everybody wants to use the vaginal estrogens, but they're not systemic, they're not absorbed, they don't change your blood level. So in our minds, everybody can have them. In our surgeon's minds, breast cancer patients still can't um, because they're, it's still estrogen. It's in the room. There are some of them just won't even let estrogen in the room with them or a soybean. Um, <clears throat> but they want to uh, fix the vaginal tissues, and some will wait five years down the road to pass their diagnosis. And it's a lifestyle. What if she's only like 45 and it's like, you know, I've got some fun years ahead of me. I don't want to feel like this. I will. You know, we'll talk about it. And I do always ask them to ask their oncologist so I don't get in too much trouble. Um, but if they understand that it's really, truly topical therapy, then most of them can, can try that. Um, if that's the only thing that's bugging them, 
they're going, I don't have any hot flashes, I'm fine. Don't give them systemic unless they want it for other reasons, which could be fun. Just fix the vagina. So most will get better. Um, it improves the blood flow. If you looked under a microscope, you'd see more of the superficial cells come back. Um, the pH gets back to a lower amount. Um, elasticity better, sexual activity better. It doesn't mean they'll never need lubricant with sex again. It just means you've made the tissues a little more tolerant, a little stretchier, less likely to have trauma. Um, they don't have to take progesterone because it's not absorbed, so the uterus, we think, doesn't care. When they study that, they watched them for like a year, never saw any buildup of the endometrium, so these get to be there without progesterone to protect the uterus. So that's what we know now. They've just come out with two more vaginal estrogens, but all the doses are the same, so they're not rehashing all that information. <laughs> so we have a few. I had to add two to the list uh, since last time I gave this lecture. Um, esterase, estradiol, again, you hear about bioidentical compounded. Bioidentical means it's the same version our body makes, right? Mm -hmm. So estradiol is what we have. So esterase cream is out there, Premembrane cream, um, the estradiol ring, which is something you leave in place for those who may have done a contraception lecture already. Mm -hmm. A lot like the Duva ring, mm -hmm. a little bit smaller and sturdier, but the idea is you just place it, I always tell them it's a halo around your cervix, just to get it up there. Uh, and it stays in place for three months. So who wants to load a flow cream applicator all the time? Nobody, really. So we use a lot of these others in the tablets because those are easier. Cream is good externally if that's where the problem is. Especially the fissuring between the labia, that's a common place you'll see little tears. Um, so the badge of favor little tablets are on the end of a very non-environmental applicator, every little tablet. Um, and just come out a couple months ago is the uh, estradiol suppository. We're smart enough to take it and put it up there with the finger. You don't have to have that plastic applicator that's going to end up, I guess, in our oceans like everything else. So I'm not sure how they got the name, except I see two Vexes in it. I'm Vexy. Uh, it makes me think that's on. I'm too sexy for me. <laughs> Vexy just kind of sounds that way. I guess that's okay. Uh, the Intra Rosa is a neuroid. It's mostly it's a steroid like DHEA, so it converts to estrogen or testosterone. It's more of a good old waxy, waxy, glycerin -y type suppository where the others like little tablets that are fairly small. But they all work. It's just whatever someone wants to use. If it's new, it's costly. So again, we have copay cards. If you Google one of those online, you'll probably find a discount card that will get most of these things for about 25 bucks a month. But a tube of estradiol cream is over 200 bucks. That's just the cost of a lot of these things is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing new about that ingredient. But, so we're really trying to help people with the price so they can get it. And once you're over 65 and on Medicare, they don't want to pay for anything mm -hmm. hormonal for you because they're looking at some criteria that say it's unsafe. But we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Ospema uh, uh, is the brand name for Ospemaphene, and it's the um, CIRM. So we all talked about CIRMs, like tamoxifen, we've heard of those things, selective estrogen receptor modulators. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of them. Basically, there's a couple of basic uh, estrogen receptors we have, and they've picked um, ingredients that will only affect one of them. So with this CIRM, the vagina sees it, but the uterus doesn't. And so we can't give someone systemic estrogen without progesterone, we'll build up the endometrium and increase in mitral cancer risk. So this one, the uterus isn't supposed to care. Um, I'm supposed to give this to folks who um, say they have this crudity. If they just say my vagina is dry but it's not bothering them, then it doesn't meet their criteria. But we look at all these the same. So I've had less takers on this because not everybody wants to have something systemic when they feel like they can do something topical, not absorbed, and that seems logical to me. Um, and it may make them have hot flashes. So it's not quite as popular, but it is out there. It's another option for vaginal dryness and discomfort. So there's other things they can do. Uh, lubricants have been around for a long time and they keep coming up with new ones. Uh, a few years ago it was all about hyaluronic acid, now it's all about silicone based. They have cute names, Uber Lube, <laughs> Cleanse, um, Astroglide. Thank you. Um, so they all have to try to make little reasons why they're the one you should use. And yet we're going to help be um, placed before sexual activity. So it's just literally you know, to, to stop the friction and the trauma that comes from that. Uh, vaginal moisturizers are over the counter. They're more of a not water based, but more like a petrolatum based. So they're to kind of hang out in the vagina for a while for days for comfort, not just for sexual activity. Um, the laser procedures, some recent studies show that, like Mona Lisa, if you've heard of that, and some of these others, it's like a vaginal probe that gives small laser beams out. If you were to look at the vagina afterwards, magnified greatly, it would look like pegboard, lots of little holes. So it creates lots of little damaging holes so that they have to heal, build up better collagen for support, and newer tissue for lubrication. 
in the long run, though, they seem to be seeing down the road more pain issues. So, I don't know. We don't have one at our place, so I've seen them at the meetings. Um, sexual activity brings blood flow to the tissues every time. I've seen the older ladies who are still more active, and they tend to have vaginas that aren't having issues right now. So. Um, it's kind of harder to get it back when someone goes for years and the vagina gets changes, gets really thin. It takes a while to kind of get it back, then to keep it there. <clears throat> so along with that topic of sexual function, which, uh, like I said, if I could fix libidos and stuff, I would have a happy crowd. Those who do fix that, maybe use pellet therapy, which we won't get started on that too much. Not a fan yet. Um, so, the sexual function, obviously from the thinner tissues, pain with intercourse, um, if they're taking systemic right off the bat from the time of menopause, the tissues are probably going to stay a little better because they've never really gone for years without their estrogen. Um, and you can have systemic and uh, give topical, so you can do both. Um, so that can help to relieve the pain with intercourse issues. Once people have dyspareunia, uh, you know, it gives me a little bit of a negative reinforcement. It's like, hmm, why do I want to do something that hurts again? You know, and gradually they just avoid intercourse altogether. Um, systemic therapy isn't recommended to treat sexual function unless people um, are actually diagnosed with hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Then they think there may be some benefit, but that's a psychiatric diagnosis and most women don't believe that. Um, so there is a place where it might help, but to give somebody estrogen and actually to give them testosterone when they survey and try and rate that doesn't make libido better directly. If it gets rid of your pain with intercourse, yes, it's probably going to help your libido because now it doesn't hurt that sex. We mentioned the testosterone doesn't continue to go any lower. It's already bottomed out, basically, by the time you're going to pause. Um, a newer medicine, now I'm going to say newer, two or three years at least, um, has been out for treatment of the hypoactive sexual desire disorder, which is what that means, in premenopausal women. Um, we actually, none of us that I know of have done it, but you actually have to go through some training to be able to prescribe it uh, because it has um, such side effects, especially hypotension. So if you ever saw it advertised or read about it, um, that was a bad side effect. It started out being an antidepressant they were studying. It didn't work, but they, um, the women had 0.5 more satisfying sexual episodes per month when they took it. Not a whole lot of difference. Um, the other thing we joke about is they also said you can't have alcohol while you're taking this. So we just soon had a glass of wine. Um, but, uh, so I don't know anybody that has gone through their little training course so that they can prescribe it, because you have to be so aware of counseling on the side effects. Um, it doesn't seem like it has a really big effect um, that we felt that we needed it in our armamentarium. <coughs> I told you all, I stole that from a recent lecture that wasn't even about menopause. Um, everybody in the room was holding up their care about taking a picture. That's funny. I don't know, it's funny. Um, so it is important for the relationship for the future of desire. Again, you don't want to, who goes out and you know, does something that's, that's painful on purpose. So we do think it is important. Uh, and when women say they have a decreased libido, there's so many inputs, the relationship, their mm -hmm. physical health, their body image. They've talked about all these things being major contributors. So it's not simple um, for women to sometimes find playtime. Um, we'll get through a couple of these a little bit. Um, so we do have medical reasons that we, are, that we might be talking about with this age group. We talked about screening as a preventive uh, evaluation for someone. So breast cancer, um, which we've seen, you know, used to be just the menopausal things that usually had it, so we didn't have to worry about, you know, any bleeding issues. Now we've got some of the younger women who are being treated, and they may still be even having cycles when they're on tamoxifen. So we've got to kind of learn to work with different age groups. So the, the risk really hasn't changed in a while, about one out of eight um, women in the U.S. Uh, we can't fix the two main risk factors, um, which is uh, the same ones we have for like hip fractures. We can't fix our parents. We've all probably tried. Um, and none of us really want to stop having our birthdays, so age and gender are the two risk factors that we have. Men can get it, but obviously not as much. Um, Self-breast exam, they've recently come out and said, uh, we don't need to tell people to do this anymore. Now we're supposed to call it self breast awareness. And even when I said that the other day, someone said, so I'm aware I've got two breasts. Yeah. <laughs> um, then, that old monthly little note in the shower, check them all the time, is not what we're supposed to be telling people because it's just not that effective and they find things that are not actually a problem. Um, so normally, in the normal everyday, you know, showering, washing, yes, be aware if there's physical appearance changes, dimpling, you feel anything when you're washing. So it's just not really the strict kind of way that we're used to tell them to check themselves all the time. 
Uh, mammogram is still best screening for the money, and again, especially with the 50 mammogram. MRI, as we mentioned, we see too much, um, but only for the high risk folks usually. Ultrasound, especially in someone younger, to determine a cystic from solid, a cyst from a fibroma, from anything they actually have to worry about, sometimes dilated ducts, other things that they can see. Um, ductal lavage, amazingly, they can cannulate and uh, put fluid in there and rinse them out and get cytology when they're looking for some of the breast cancer risk. There are all ways of screening. Um, you can see the list of risk factors. More trendy now is, you know, a lot of the genetics. So the BRCA2, we know, and BRCA1 increase it. BRCA2 increases their ovarian cancer risk. Um, so the breast doctors, they don't check this a lot. They're checking for other the receptors so they know how to treat the person after. They've already decided they have breast cancer, lumpectomy, tamoxifen, or something. Um, but if there's some family history, BRCA2 matters more to us because that means their risk of ovarian cancer has gone up. Uh, it is recommended they get their ovaries out by their mid-40s if they have that mutation. Um, we just did that two days ago for someone. One first patient, we did like three laparoscopy BSOs. It's, and one was for the BRCA2. Later, the person's going to get a um, prophylactic mastectomy. Um, the other one actually had carcinoma in site too. And her periods came back after her um, therapy was completed because she basically took a GNR agonist um, and she wasn't done having cycles. But she didn't want any estrogen in her body anymore. So, different reasons, but the, the genetics do matter to us. So, besides breast, they do matter for our ovaries too. Um, other cancer history, first degree relatives, menarche and menopause, that's basically reflecting a long time of estrogen exposure. Um, waiting till you have your first kid. I snuck mine in at 29. Got that mm -hmm. risk out of the way. Obesity, again, more estrogen, right? Um, alcohol, well, just last week they said there's no drink amount that's safe. Mm -hmm. That was all disappointing to <laughs> hear. I know my kids who are like your age, they don't like watch news. It's whatever feed they choose to get on their phone, but there was that. It was a preventer task force, I think, mm -hmm. said, oh, there's no amount that's good. Oh, well. Lack of exercise, so we want to keep people moving. Um, we talked about vitamin D a little bit, poor diet, otherwise, a lot of these things can reflect all that risk for breast cancer. So, along with all those risks, trying to fix them all is what will help us get rid of some of those lifestyle changes, losing weight, because again, that's more estrogen, same for alcohol. Um, some of them at, at risk may take preventive therapy without ever having anything. Um, Evista, which is raloxifene, was first studied for that. Um, for bones, I'm sorry, and then they realized it was working like tamoxifen that decreased the risk of someone ever getting a breast cancer. Aromatase inhibitors are usually used for the menopausal ladies and to prevent recurrence. Um, and I don't prescribe these drugs. I'm the one who just follows the folks who have them. Um, and the preventive mastectomy, like I just mentioned. Um, the tamoxifen, we know, can stimulate the endometrium. So again, it, it's like the breast guys down the hall from us are giving it to them. We have to make sure that they don't have bleeding irregularities. That was easy when they were all postmenopausal and breast cancer. Now we've had more and more people who are not menopausal yet with tamoxifen. It's like, okay, as long as she's having regular periods, I'm good. Um, whereas the other gang, if they had any bleeding, it was wrong. They were menopausal. Um, but I can say the tamoxifen patients with bleeding irregularities at biopsy, I've never found anything worse than hyperplasia. So we do kind of check these things <coughs> excuse me, early. Uh, and we'll usually find them before we're actually having a problem. But they're well counseled bleeding problems. But tamoxifen can be over, over uh, stimulated in the metrum. <clears throat> a big question: hormone therapy, breast cancer, obviously, and breast disease in general. Um, if someone's had breast cancer, they can't have it. They do check them for receptors, but that's so they know they can use uh, an antagonist to, to block their um, breast receptors. Um, when we give somebody hormone therapy who's fine, gotten the risks, they want to take it. The study that made everybody quit hormone therapy years ago, the Women's Health Initiative, uh, a lot of people stopped. Now people are kind of back, understanding they're, we've looked at it a little closer. Um, Y'all heard of that study, everybody likes to quote the Women's Health Initiative. They're still looking at subgroups of it for other things. Uh, but the average age of the patients was 63. They weren't supposed to have hot flashes. They were looking at it to see if it prevented cardiovascular disease. That's not what we give it for. We give it to prevent symptoms. So that's not an age group where we start hormone therapy. Um, if people don't have a reason, we're not giving it to someone. Again, hot flashes is the usual main reason. So it wasn't a logical group from our standpoint, uh, but it scared everybody off of it because they did have some increased risk of uh, breast cancer when they took estrogen and progesterone for more than five years. They, what they were using was Prempro, which is a conjugated equine, and Medroxyprogesterone or Provera. Um, and that, I mean, I wrote, Premarin used to be like the only thing we had. You know, it was like everybody took Premarin. Um, and now we're pretty much, I haven't written for it in quite a while because I have others, bioidentical, safer, 
other progesterones that we feel like aren't the culprit, because what seems like the culprit in here was the progesterone. The estrogen only group, followed them for seven years and no increased risk. Well, I thought that estrogen was the bad guy to the boobs. Hmm. It seems like this combination of perhaps that progesterone had a little more to do with it. Um, so, micronized progesterone, which is the bioidentical version we have now, both compounded and pharmaceutical, doesn't seem to have the same risk. So, we're kind of learning a little bit, and people can sort of have their cake and eat it too with their hormone therapy now and still stay safer. Um, if you waited about five years and the breast didn't seem to have an increased risk, but now we've missed other benefits. They've had hot flashes, they've had more bone loss. So, you got to figure out what that individual's need may be. Um, most people take it continuous nowadays. They take a little estrogen, progesterone every day, just like a birth control pill. Some actually are the same ingredients, just less of it. Um, so it doesn't seem to matter if they cycle, which is what we used to make people do. That seems to me now, versus continuous daily. The risks uh, really haven't been looked at long enough to know. And that's just a summary not to look at deeply, but the times you see the estrogen only, the relative risk is barely over one. Like the bottom of each of those categories has where it's just estrogen, whereas you can see when it's the first big group that combined has an increased risk the longer they used it. So the best folks who can have it are those who've had a hysterectomy and I can just give them estrogen. They're in the safest group to have their hormone therapy and not have really any change in their risk. And it's not a short conversation to have. Um, is that a good stopping point for the moment? You want to get rid of that morning coffee? <laughs>